I had the opportunity of a lifetime this summer. I think I've mentioned it before, but one of my daughters is a Forest Service archaeologist, and while she was on survey this year, she found a cliff dwelling the forest didn't have on record. And of course, that's, that's a very rare and exciting find. Because of its inaccessibility, they asked me to join them as they recorded it, and I used my drone to photograph the cliff structure in as much detail as I could. It was a very exciting adventure for me, and of course, as a father, it was exceptionally rewarding and fun to have your daughter take her daddy to work in a role reversal. The structure, art, and location make it a dead ringer as a Fremont cultural site. The Fremont are a little-known culture that once covered most of the eastern Great Basin area and spilled out into many of the areas surrounding it, most notably the Colorado Plateau. And while the archaeologists documented many interesting finds at this site, there were no points or even debitage discovered on the survey. Of course, this is a lithics and mapping channel, so I decided to use my excitement about it all and look into what stone points the Fremont were commonly using. This turned out to be a bigger question than I anticipated. The Fremont cultural ways spanned a long period of time, from approximately 0 AD or CE till about 1300 to 1400 CE in some areas. First of all, this means these rocks and mud ruins are likely 800 to 2000 years old, which is just mind-blowing. You can see how well the cliff has protected and preserved them. It's as if they just left them the other day. Secondly, the type of points the Fremont used span from atlatl darts for hundreds or even a thousand years and on into arrow points as the bow arrived and was used by the Fremont sometime beginning around 500 to 700 CE. Leaning into the research, I found a specialized Great Basin Humboldt type called the Triple T, and the Fremont seem to be the final caretakers for it. ProjectilePoint.net has a very nice summary about the Triple T, so let's take a look. First of all, you can see the map shows its full distribution over time, and it seems to match Humboldt pretty precisely. The Fremont culture isn't usually considered to be this broadly distributed, and they more or less lived in the areas around the modern Utah boundaries, while spilling out into areas of modern Nevada, Idaho, Wyoming, and Colorado. The Four Corners region is, for the most part, considered a different cultural area and home of the ancestral Puebloans, or Anasazi, as they used to be called in Old Navajo or Diné. Of course, the two cultures would have interacted and influenced each other heavily, and there are many obvious overlaps, but they are commonly considered separate cultures academically. We can see that the Triple T was in use well before the Fremont cultural ways, up until about 1000 BCE. This is still a thousand years or so before Fremont are typically displaying the common signs of being a distinct culture, but almost certainly the earliest form of Fremont were beginning to take shape at this time. So let's take a look at what makes this Humboldt variant distinct. The Triple T seems to commonly have a wider concave base. There is a discussion about Humboldt variations having different flaking patterns, but it appears the Triple T makers weren't as concerned about this, and they more frequently display random flaking patterns. This may suggest they were more concerned about the shape and functionality of the point than with any particular manufacturing process, but it's tough to say. Most importantly, for our purposes, we see that the Fremont appear to have been the inheritors of this heirloom Humboldt type. There's a few reference pictures, and we can get a sense of the Triple T's shape and its wide and concave base. They do in fact look, as you can see, like long-lived and heavily resharpened Humboldts. I like the one in the middle here, and it seems to have the most well-defined shape. It also looks like it may be a tiger or oil chert from the Colorado Plateau somewhere, and I happen to have an oil chert preform. I think it'll work nicely for this project. So with that, let's get chipping. I 
I was taking a few practice swings with the bison horn before starting the camera. And this is a no joke, extremely tough material of course. But the bison horn was doing a good job. It seemed like it was going to be the right tool. And then it split the horn. And it's really too bad because it was clearing the flakes very nicely. It was doing kind of okay with the split, but the split was absorbing most of the blow. So I was forced to switch over to the horizontal punch, which I'm extremely out of practice on. Should have taken a few warm-up hits. For the most part, everything went okay. Just slowly working my way around, finding little ridges to take off some of the preform rough spots and stacks. There's one little island that's building up over on that other edge. This oil shirt has been tough on my equipment. That little island is definitely getting to be a little problem here. I, I can't get to it from either side effectively, so I know there's a lot of shaping I need to do, so I decided just to shift gears here. We'll bring the top edges in, start to take their shape, and I know I've got to kind of bring that teardrop shape into the triple T here on the bottom. So I'm hoping as I, I push flakes across here and shape it, I'll be able to get a chance to catch that little, that little island out there and see if we can't get it off later. My approach is not to come directly into it, of course, I don't want to run right into that island and, and cause a bigger problem stacking into it, so I'm just slowly, from each end, driving flakes, that makes a, a shallow little ridge for me to follow on the next one, 
just working my way towards it from each end as we're shaping and then finally finally we catch it oh I know it's still looking a little rough there, and it is, but the bison, the bison pressure flaker is doing so well on it, um, and we've got a long ways to come in, so I've really sped this section up. It just took a long time to, to slowly work this without creating any more damage for myself to have to deal with and slowly smooth out the things that needed smoothing, so we're just going to speed up here and start to curve the base in. As you can see, we ended up uh, above average on the length here. We're still within what's considered normal, I guess, for sizing, but yeah, we're definitely long. Width-wise, we're, we're inside the average. And I measured the base even though there's no known average measurement that I could find in any papers or any reference. I did miss the thickness, but we're right at about 5 mil. And there you have it, a Fremont Triple T knife. Handles hold separately. All right, since you hung around, check this out. You might not notice it at first glance when the video goes by. Look real close here. There's a little pile of rocks, and they're stacked perfectly in a line. This is the granary, and it's been opened. And I think it's been opened by the original inhabitants. The ones to the left at the bottom 
are kind of melting into the platform there. And they've been there so long. I can just imagine some parent pulling them out one at a time and striking their kid. Here, set these out, you know, in a perfect row so we can put them back. If you don't take the time to do it right, you'll take the time to do it twice, right? Kind of a lecture going on. I think that's just such a cool human thing uh, that we can see by the setting out of the stones, remembering how they go back in place as they left it for the last time. So cool.